Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Dr. Carl Dodrill, PhD, who is past dean of the Seattle AGO chapter and also president of the Pipe Organ Foundation. His work has focused on encouraging young people's interest in organ and also on making the pipe organ appealing to and available to people in the general population. Dr. Dodrill is also Professor Emeritus of Neurology, Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Neurological Surgery at the University of Washington. In today's conversation we will talk about what it takes to increase public's interest in organ recitals, a subject very relevant these days when church attendance is slowly declining in the Western society. Let's go to the show. Welcome, Carl. I'm so delighted that you are able to join this conversation. Uh, I've been following your work on uh, on American Organist magazine uh, very closely, and you've written a fantastic series of uh, of uh, articles about uh, uh, increasing uh, interest in organ recitals. This is a very crucial piece of uh, research, right? And thank you so much for sharing uh, for your work that you will be sharing with us today. You are ge- very generous. And v- welcome to the show. You are very welcome, Vitas, and I'm delighted to be asked to be involved. Great. I, I hope people from around the world, basically from 89 countries, will get so much in- inspiration from this talk, from our uh, f- conversation, that they will think uh, uh, very hard how to do this uh, in their own communities, in their own congregations, maybe their own also feel that attendance in organ uh, recitals is diminishing and you you will share some research you did right it's very very interesting but for starters maybe uh, Carl uh, I always ask people how they first uh, uh, fell in love with with the organ it's very fascinating to go back in time and remember the story when you were little perhaps can you share that yes I can Uh, I grew up in a desert community in California. It was actually on the Mojave Desert. Mm -hmm. And um, although the the, uh, town where we were located had about 7,000 people, there was only one small pipe organ. And yet I was interested in it. And then when I went on to college in Santa Barbara, California, I had the chance to hear bigger organs. And then in graduate school at Purdue University in Indiana, very large organs. And so I became more and more interested, but I continued in my studies in psychology. I became a psychologist. And of course, I had to raise money for a family and get married and have children and everything. So I was not able to pursue my interests until, in fact, we were at the point where our children were going to college. And at that point, my wife started to take organ lessons, and I began to work in a pipe organ shop. It's the Paul Fritz shop Mm -hmm. in Tacoma, Washington. He makes very fine tracker mechanical action organs after the pattern of Arp Schnitger in North Germany. And so I worked with him as much as I could, doing volunteer work for three years. Then we developed an interest of having an organ in our own home. So we did get a pipe organ for our own home, which we had for 18 years in our home. And then I started the Pipe Organ Foundation, which is designed to save pipe organs that are being discarded. And, of course, I became involved in the American Guild of Organists, even though I'm approaching this whole topic from a person who is working on building and saving pipe organs, rebuilding them. We have one in the shop right now. Mm -hmm. We have rebuilt and will be placing in less than a month. But to save the instruments, I approached that from that end, but became more involved in the American Guild of Organists and eventually became dean and so on. So it's over time that I developed this interest. Fantastic, Carl. Uh, Of course, uh, 
although you are approaching this research from the perspective of the person who is trying to preserve the instrument itself it's very well connected with the with the people with the people and the music right with the art uh, of organ playing because uh, let's face it uh, if if there was no music right there was uh, there would be no organ builders also it's all connected right and with yeah, people absolutely. also so yes. I think you are right on track, t on track, and uh, your uh, research uh, c uh, and will be very, very insightful and ins inspiration from uh, for uh, for around uh, for a lot of people around the world. So, so uh, Carl, what you did uh, is very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit how did your res uh, research start and uh, who inspired it? Yes. Well, because I was a psychologist and actually a neuropsychologist, mm -hmm. I worked with people with epilepsy for mm -hmm. 30 years at the University of Washington. And this is a university where there is a strong emphasis on publication of research, of doing empirical research. When I came to the area of organs, I took that interest in publishing research and doing actual studies. And that is what you're going to see today as a result of my carrying over this research interest and statistics and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. the th the thing that I really was convinced about was that it was so sad that here we have the king of instruments that we are playing, the very best musical instrument in the world, and yet the interest in this instrument was seemed to be going down. And how, what can we do to make it more appealing to the public? So that's what really got me started doing this research. Fantastic. Very good intention. And... Um well, uh, it's not in o only in America that uh, you see decline in, in the interest of, of organ playing, right? Probably in all Western civilization, probably. It's because maybe people are not as interested in church anymore, right? Uh, it's not the case with, with the, probably with um, countries like uh, China, Korea and Japan now, because they they we can feel that more and more organs are being built in that particular part of the world somehow it's not connected with religion at, at all, all almost not all, not not connected right uh, yes and that uh, um, s uh, secular connotation is is just like a interesting uh, uh, musical instrument right and uh, without any religious background in China, for example, or Taiwan, or Korea, or even Japan, right? But in our part of the world, in, in Western society, yes, people are mm, interested in, in other things, right? For example, um, organ once was a big part of culture, right? Cultural identity of in Europe, right? But, uh, yes. but now, uh, organ is... Uh, culture itself is not a very big deal in people's life in general. So, and even more so is with the organ. It's, it's been probably ma marginalized uh, very, very uh, evidently uh, around the world in Western societies, right? So, yes. So tell us a little bit about your research and um, what what uh, what you discovered. Okay, so I would like to switch now to the PowerPoint file using this the screen sharing approach. So let's see if we can do, make this work. Fantastic. We yeah. will be seeing uh, slides and uh, we will be seeing some research data on the screen that people can really see. Uh, so make sure you will, will also uh, see the video of our conversation, not only the audio, but also the video, because vi the video will be very, very important as well here. I can see the, yes. the screen now. You can see the, and, and the, the slide that says the basic question. Right. I can. Okay. So, so here is the basic question at hand. What can we do to make our organ playing as appealing and enjoyable to all people so that they will want to come back and to hear the organ again and again? That's really the question that I want to us to address today. 
here are the three the list of the three studies that I have done and published and they are all to be found on the uh, our website of the Pipe Organ Foundation. So at the bottom of the screen, everyone looking at this, mm -hmm. if you make a note of that URL down there and go to our Pipe Organ Foundation website and look under News, you will find these three articles. And they are there completely with all the pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. And so that you can get them anywhere in the world, you can get all three of these articles. Great, great. Very important to go and see for yourself what you did, right? To see, uh, uh, because these articles will will uh, shed very, uh, some light on your research, right? And people can discover very interesting things. <laughs> Yes, what I would like to do now is just go through and just summarize the basic findings. I will, of course, not include the details, but everyone can go and find the article and look at the details that they have an interest on. These articles actually focus on tools which the organist can use to make their playing as appealing as possible to the public in general. Okay, so they give you tools, the ideas of how to make your organ playing very appealing. The first one, for example, focuses on variety in the music played. The second one on familiarity of the music played. And the third article doesn't focus on the music itself, but rather on the organist mm -hmm. and what the organist does to make the, the music as appealing as possible. Our next slide gives the basic assumptions that I used in doing these studies. First of all, it is my firm belief that the audiences that we play to want to be connected with every piece of music that they hear. When they sit there and listen to the music, I believe they search for a connection. If they feel connected with the music, they're likely to find meaning in the music. If they find meaning in the music, it's more appealing and enjoyable to them. And if it's appeal, appealing and enjoyable, they're likely to return to hear more, increasing the attendance at organ recitals, concerts, and so on any place where the organ is played. These are the basic assumptions and I think if we look at this whole idea of people want to be connected with the music, they want to find meaning in the music and if they do they find the music to be more appealing. So as organists let's help them to get connected to the music. So that's what all of this is about. And at the bottom one secret to excellence in organ playing is for the organist to help the audience connect to each piece of music played. And the major objective of this research is to provide the organist with tools to help the organist do that. So this is the first study and it gives you the first tool. And that is that a variety in the music played. Right you will see that if you prov provide a lot of variety, people find that they can connect with at least some of the pieces and they find meaning, they're enjoyable, and they are able and are willing then to return to hear more. Okay, let it, me interrupt, Carl, and, and uh, put it if I understand it uh, correctly. So imagine an organist, right, who wants to perform uh, uh, as, as one particular in, uh, composer, right? Uh, just Bach, right? Or just Buxtehude, yes. or just Frank, right? And that music right. might be very fascinating and high quality for that musician, right? Uh, he would be, or she would be in love with that organ, uh, with that uh, music, right? But in the audience, there are maybe hundreds of different uh, people with different approaches, different perspectives, uh, right? And uh, you need some variety, right, to connect uh, with um, at least a few of them, right? Uh, not one. If you if you connect with one who who likes, for example, Bach, what you're playing, that's very good. But what about the the others, right? 
Yes, mm -hmm. right. Okay, now if you're doing an all Bach concert or recital, mm -hmm. which some of us do, then what, what this would suggest is that you pick out different styles of what Bach did over the period of his writing. Mm -hmm. Don't just all do, you know, one particular group, uh, sonatas or prelude and fugue or whatever, but get variety, build in variety in any way that you can, if in fact it's intended to be an all Bach concert. Now, if you can have other composers as well, and those that come from different eras of time and different countries, then I think that's even better. But for a particular thing that you do, it might have to be all Bach. And if so, then I would look for variety within Bach. That's true. That's true because Bach wrote not only fugues, right, and not only oh, chorales. Sure. He wrote many, many trio sonatas and concertos, right. You can really combine those different uh, approaches and make the music uh, more, more colorful, more varied. You, you can, you can vary the music in terms of keys, right, and moods and tempi and registration also. Not only, also very fast and loud, right, but also do some contrast. That's absolutely. I think that's what you're talking right. about. Good. It definitely is. Mm -hmm. So at this concert or recital, I asked Mel Butler to be the concert artist to play the the concert for us. And, and Mel Butler was the canon musician at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle for many years, and he is one of the best known organists in our part of the United States. I asked him to play a highly varied program because I wanted to appeal to people from the general public. We advertised this in the local newspaper and in the radio, mm -hmm. and we wanted people in general to come, not just musicians or organists. And so he agreed to do this. And as you can see from the music chosen, he picked out mostly classical pieces, exactly like you would expect. But he also picked out two popular pieces. And this is quite interesting, I think, what he picked out. Uh, William Albright's Sweet Sixteenths, which is a concert rag for organ. Now, you can imagine most of you listening to this podcast would not necessarily pick out something like this for an organ recital, but in fact he picked this out. He also picked out a blues piece, which is Thomas uh, Fats Waller's a piece, The Rusty Pale Blues. So this then represented a huge contrast into the usual classical pieces and some of the profound Bach and Mozart pieces and so on that he played. In addition, he picked out three hymns. He had extensive and wonderful preludes to those hymns, and the audience sang the hymn out of the hymn book. So then this whole program of the music chosen is much more varied and it was intended to be that, then is the usual case. So the question is, will this get people interested in having everything so varied? Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you uh, so, uh, so uh, Carl, uh, this variedness is, is uh, probably a good thing for, for a general audience, right? They're not specialized right. in any particular period or era or, uh, or style, right? They don't know much about the organ at all. So probably it, it's good to give them a taste of about, uh, you know, many things, about everything. Uh, the best of organ that it has to offer, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, in these various genres of music. And so that's the intention on this study, is to appeal to a general audience from the general population. We want to get them interested. Well, 116 people indeed did come and completed questionnaires which gave information about themselves, their musical background, and they also rated each one of the 10 pieces from one to five on it being not appealing at all or extremely appealing. So here is the chance for us to study and see these different types of music in the general audience. Who do they appeal to? 
And the results at the bottom of the screen, the degree of appeal was examined for each piece of music, the three types of music, and each type of music in relationship to musical background. Now, what kind of organ was played? And this is one of the organs. This is at Mercer Island Presbyterian Church. And this is one of the organs that our Pipe Organ Foundation that I had up and I direct, we made this organ. Mm -hmm. And this organ is actually from pieces of older organs that we have saved that were being discarded. And we take the good things, we put aside the bad, and we assemble them very carefully. And I had some colleagues who are working uh, with me on this who did the basic design uh, work uh, and so on as we were doing this instrument. But this is how it looks at the front of the church. It is a three manual instrument with 27 ranks of pipes and it is electric action. It's also in terms of disposition American classical, it's orchestral, and romantic. So it has a fair number of reeds and strings in this instrument which is intended to accommodate a broad range of music to be played. So here are the results. Very briefly summarized, you can get more from the article. The average appeal ratings of, ins of the types of music are given here and they're all high. They're all above four. Mm -hmm. As you look at this though, you can see that the popular music actually came out on the top. And if you do a statistic, statistical test, in fact, it was statistically better than the other two types of music. Now, you must really understand that Dr. Butler is a fabulous organist, and he played all three kinds of, of pieces extremely well. But what it means, I think, is that people enjoyed the variety from one piece to the next. And they did not expect to hear the popular music. They expected to hear the classical, and it was kind of refreshing to them. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the fact that the score is so high with popular is partly a, sort of a novelty effect. Uh, and if you had it exactly the same in terms of proportion, one-third, one-third, one-third across the three types of instrument uh, or music, perhaps the scores would have been more equal. But the thing that's of interest, I think, to all of us who are trained in terms of doing classical organ and then liturgical as well, is that perhaps the people that we're playing to when we're able, we might want to put in some popular things insofar as we can to give variety to the music. True. So, Carl, uh, so looking uh, at that... Um uh, table or piece of research uh, can I uh, am I right saying that these people uh, are uh, seeing the organ for the first time in their lives basically or not well there would be some that some. have never seen the organ played like this in other words if you think of especially popular music they don't think about organ at all they think of guitar Mm -hmm. and drums and bands and things like that and so it's quite revealing mm -hmm. I think to them how versatile the pipe organ is fantastic good and now with the in the middle of the slide what about those people who had a lot of experience with classical music a number of them had were musicians who are trained classically they play various instruments mm -hmm. and so on they have high experience with classical music versus low how would they evaluate the the appeal of classical music and popular music and as you can see right in the middle of the screen those with low experience in classical music rated the classical music lower Mm -hmm. than those with high experience. Those with high experience, I think, appreciate the classical music and the complexity, so their average rating of 4.49 is very high mm -hmm. and is higher than those who did not have the background in classical music. Mm -hmm. 
To that, the right, however, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's logical, right, Carl? Uh, because the, the more experience with something you have in your life, the more you will appreciate that thing, right? So with classical exactly. music is the same thing. So it it's a sign, it's a good sign for our musical education at schools, right? Your research shows basically if you we, we want to co continue this uh, cultural thing going in 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 America, in America, for example, we need some uh, classical music education at schools, right? More and more, perhaps. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that's most remarkable is on the right side for the popular music, and what this is says that no matter how much interest you have in classical music and what, how strong a background, you really enjoyed the popular music. Those two pieces that were played, which are basically theater organ pieces, you very much enjoyed those pieces, whether you have little or high experience in classical music. And so I think that this is important to us because we think, oh, these people that we are playing to, they are all classical musicians. That is all they want to hear. They don't want to hear popular music. But these figures suggest, well, maybe they do. Maybe they would enjoy hearing at least some popular music as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. What, what is of interest here, too, Vitus, is that I'm in the theater organ society in, in, in our region. And one of the things that has existed in the theater organ society is the feeling that their people only want to hear popular music. But in fact, I have gone to some of their concerts where occasionally classical music was played at a theater organ concert and the people there absolutely loved the classical music. That's interesting. It is. And what it suggests that people want a variety in the music they hear. That's where they get the meaning, is the variety of the music they hear. So if you were to look finally at the bottom of the slide, you would see that 47 people wrote comments on their questionnaires, and the big theme of their comments was... They love the wide variety of the music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what really made it appealing was variety. Great. Great. And of course, Carl, uh, this uh, this uniqueness of theater organ is 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 uh, understandable. But uh, they also love uh, classical music as well. I have some uh, organ students who play uh, theater organs. For example, they are interested in theater organs. I'm not an expert in theater music, right? So I only can teach them classical approaches to, to, to organ playing, but they do uh, feel interest in classical music as well, in, as well as theater. Right. Very much. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you examples of classical music played at theater organ concerts that absolutely brought down the house with people cheering and so on for classical music. It's sure. amazing, it's actually. Amazing. It people, people in general, you cannot categorize them as just classical or just popular. They would like to hear both. True, true. That is the point of this. Now, this is the first study. So, uh, should we go on to the next one? Fantastic. Let's go on. Okay. This has to do with familiarity of the music played. Does it make a difference if you play things that nobody knows versus those that at least some people know in the audience? So we actually went to St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle to do this study, and Alan DePew was the organist there who was one of the organists at the cathedral at that time. He chose classical composers entirely, and you can see the list of them there. We had a good audience. This audience had a strong background in classical music, more than the general population that we had for the first study. And as you can see, we had the same numbers that happens who completed our questionnaires, giving information about their backgrounds, and also rating each one of the eight different pieces that were played on how appealing they thought, how much they liked them, and how familiar each piece was. Mm -hmm. 
So that gave us a chance to relate appeal and f familiarity to each other. Now this organ that was used is one of the most famous ones in the whole Seattle area. It probably it is the most famous organ. It's a Flenthrope four manual mechanical action instrument that was installed in the cathedral in about 1968 and it has been highly acclaimed as an instrument. It's been slightly added to uh, but tonally, it's 99% the same as what it was before. And again, probably the most famous organ that we have in our part of the United States. So this is a very different instrument than the last one that you saw. Fantastic. Carl, I'm holding in my hands the CD of this organ. Uh, that oh. <laughs> that was sent to me as a present by the organist and uh, recording engineer Roger Sherman, very good friend of mine. Yes. Uh, we did an interview, podcast interview recently with him, and he uh, issued this uh, Bach under the influence recording uh, uh, for the 50th anniversary of the anniversary of the Flintrop organ at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle. So. Uh, I happen to have the exact uh, CD that you are talking about, uh, about uh, this organ. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent indeed. Good. Okay, so on this instrument now, this is all going to be classical music that is going to be played. So forget the variety, forget the popularity. What we're interested in knowing is how familiar, whether fam uh, if you know the piece, do you like it more? Is, is it more appealing to you simply because you know it? Okay, so as it turns out, the pieces that, we were, that were played are listed here. And the organist picked out a number that he was interested in, but that were not known very well at all to people. And they are the first four of them that are listed there. And they had familiarity ratings less than 1.5 out of 3. In fact, they had low familiarity ratings. And as opposed to the other four given at the bottom of the screen and who that had high familiarity ratings. And so there's really quite a difference in this concert because these first four up here people just did not know them. And the last four, they knew them quite well. Like, for example, Aaron Co Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man or Adagio for Strings is much better known than any of those at the top of the screen. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, how appealing did people find the tunes that they did not know versus that they did? And on the right side, you see the numbers. And in fact, that's a rating out of five, rating one, which is uh, low appeal to five, very high appeal. And as you can see at the bottom, the 4.37, if people knew the tunes, they found them to be appealing, enjoyable to them, and probably meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. But if they did not know them, then the ratings, uh, the rating on average of 3.88 is good. Um, the, the organist, of course, was an excellent organist. There wasn't a question of playing them poorly or something. But the, that rating is not nearly as good as if they knew the tune. And at the bottom, although I don't bother organists much with statistics, I would note that those two numbers are statistically significantly different with less than one chance in a thousand that I'm wrong in saying that. In other words, it's extremely likely that, in fact, greater familiarity was associated with greater appeal of the music played. That makes sense, that, Carl, that, right? Oh. Because uh, the more we play that music or hear that music, the more we probably fall in love with that, uh, right? Uh, and, yes. and it makes sense to to study the music, right, uh, and analyze the music. Uh, but but what's interesting about this particular program to me is that uh, it seems like all American music, right? Not not necessarily all um, 
I don't know, European Baroque type of music, right? That we are right. more used to, more used to imagining that it's a, an ideal organ repertoire, right? Baroque, Baroque uh, repertoire, let's say Bach, Buxtehude, uh, Couperin, those things, right? This ideal right. period for the organ, right? But this is American yes. and and very well received among the audience. So fascinating. Yes, so it will not be as familiar to some of the people seeing this. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But what the I, the idea though is this. If you are making up and picking out pieces for a recital or a concert, you will want to consider picking out at least some pieces that people know or are very likely to know in the audience. You can pick out some that they don't and that you have an interest in, perhaps, but it would be important, I think, not to play everything that they don't know. If, if you play that, they will, I think, not find it to be very interesting or enjoyable and perhaps not meaningful them, to them as well. Mm -hmm. Agree. Okay, should we go on to our third and last study? Very interesting. Let's go on. Okay, so now this pertains not to the music itself, but to the organist. Mm -hmm. What can the organist do to make the music come across as more interesting and appealing. So we went to Michigan and got Dave Wickerham, who's a well-known organist in the United States. He's classically trained. He was a church organist for a while. He had several years of classical training, but eventually he moved in the direction of popular music and theater music. Now, he plays both wherever he goes, but at the same time, that's, he has moved in that direction. So I picked out this person to be a very different sample, a very different way of approaching organ music. When he chooses music, he selects the music on the spot. He does not have a published program. So this is not a recital in the way we would normally see. I've asked him, how do you decide what you're going to play next? And the answer is, it depends on how the audience is responding. It's how they are responding to the music in terms of seeming to enjoy it, seems to be meaningful to them, and so on. And he plays everything from memory. Mm -hmm. So that means he has no musical scores at all. Now, please do not think that he therefore plays in a sloppy way or whatever. That is not the case. But he is so experienced that he's able to do many different pieces of music entirely by memory. Now, the music that he chose, if you go through and look at what he played in this concert, for which lasted for more than an hour and a half, about 70% of it was popular. So this is very different than anything you've seen thus far. Mm -hmm. Religious or liturgical music, 15 or 20 percent. Classical music, 10 or 15 percent. So this is very different again. And then he did an interesting thing that I've not seen anyone else do, and it's because of his ability to memorize music. There was a uh, the first half of the program and then an intermission. And during the intermission, he invited people to go to a table and to write down pieces that they would like to hear in the second uh, part of the, the concert. And about 43 pieces were written down on this sheet of paper. And the second half of the concert he wound up playing 37 of those pieces, either part of them or all of them, in a continuous medley, which ran for 48 minutes. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now this is, wait a minute, this is very different than it you did. would expect, that all of us would expect. What is this? Okay, so actually the 43 pieces of music that were requested, when he looked at it, he and I talked before he went up and played, and he said, Carl, I don't know some of these. 
Well, that's not very surprising, is it? That he would not know some of them. But I sat there and made notes all the way through, and he played 37 of them. So he knew most of them. There was 101 people who came from the general public, and of course we had advertised this, and so we were now getting very general public, not as much classically trained, whereas at St. Mark's, I should point out, those people in that audience were very classically trained. So you're getting different populations in these studies. 68 of these people completed the questionnaires, giving information about themselves and their musical backgrounds. And then they related the, uh, rated the enjoyment of the program and of each piece to music variables of variety and familiarity. In other words, the studies that we've done thus far, because we wanted to touch base with those variables. But here are the four organist-related variables. First, is the organist a visible to the audience and it was the next picture I'll show you where the organist was. Does the organist speak to the audience between pieces? And this organist did but very briefly. He would just give the reason why he's playing the next piece, perhaps a brief story about why the piece was composed, but it was all interesting, it was not long information and so on. And then enthusiasm and energy put into his playing. And he was very much visible to the audience in front of him so they could evaluate this. Does he seem to be enthusiastic? Is he putting energy in? And finally, the creativity and novelty that was put into his playing. So those are the four organist-related variables. The question is, are those related to the appeal that the audience found and hopefully to their return? Well, here's a little more information over back to the first church, the organ that we built in the Pipe Organ Foundation. And there you can see his picture in the upper left. But at the bottom, I have put a sign there that says, Console Here. Because the organ console, which is in the far right, we push out into the middle so people can sit right up close to the organist and get connected with the organist that way. Now I am absolutely aware that in many churches you cannot do that. The organ, organ is at the back, the console is at the back, and you cannot do that. In some places people have used video and put it on a screen. And I can tell you stories about those that I've seen of that, and that can be quite useful. So you can see the organist's hands or feet. Uh, but in our case, we were able to put the organ right in the, the console right in front of the, uh, the crowd. And this is what the console looks like so that everybody can see. So this is a standard three manual AGO 32-note uh, pedal board radiating concave and so on, an electric action instrument. So it is a standard. And this console is actually a Kimball console. It was made in 1940 mm -hmm. that works very well in this setting. Also in this church, we were able to put pipes everywhere. This is a novelty thing, but the, uh, this is the antiphonal organ. It's on the bottom keyboard, and these are the pipes at the back. But in addition to that, we have the 16-foot uh, open wood on one side of the sanctuary. So that's on one side, and on the other side, we actually have a harp. And this, again, I would not expect most people seeing this to say that they've ever seen this. But this is metal bars with fiber hammers. It's sort of a little bit like a xylophone, but it does not have wood. Mm -hmm. It's fiber uh, hammers and metal bars. And so it gives a lovely sound that actually can be used with liturgical music. But when you walk into this sanctuary, you can actually see an organ all, on all sides of you. You're moving into the middle of the organ. And that, that is my personal philosophy as we attempt, in fact, to bring the organ to people and get them surrounded. So it's, it's sort of like if you see the violin over there playing or the cello. Isn't that wonderful to hear the sound? What would it be like if you were actually in the instrument? So anyway, just to let you know, 
uh, some of our preferences and thoughts here. And now, if we can go on, we'll go on to the results in summary form. Very interesting yes. results, right? Because now the, 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 the organist would play a lot and lot of uh, popular repertoire from pop music, right? And yes. only part of it was classical and church related, right? Um, yes. But it would be very interesting to, to see how people responded to, uh, to organist's creativity and novelty and the way that he was visible and the way that he presented the program, right? Ch uh, uh, talked about that and energy, right, uh, which went uh, into the audience. So let's see what is the result. <laughs> Yes, you are focused exactly right mm -hmm. as far as I am concerned. And, and may I say, too, I know that a lot of people listening to this, this is, is somewhat foreign and difficult for them. Uh, for example, they, they have been told, don't talk. Uh, uh, convey the meaning by the music, not by talking. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, let's look at the results. First, we look at the variety of music played, and we find mm -hmm. that, in fact, the average score was 8.86 on a 1 to 10 scale. And that was relates to our first study as well, and it confirms the fact that a variety of music played is very much related mm -hmm. to whether people find the music to be enjoyable and appealing. Very much related. How familiar is the music? That's also very much related. 8.39 is a high score. It's not as high as variety as you can see, but still, it is well up there. True. Now, how, how, how important are the four organist-related variables? Like, is the vis visibility of the organist to the audience important? And the answer is 8.58, mm -hmm. which says, yes, it is very important. And you can imagine now, if you went to see the symphony, you, you want to go hear the symphony or orchestra or whatever, and they have all the chairs turned backwards. So you cannot, you, you hear them, but you cannot see them play. Then what would your interest be? You can see the, right away, you would be less interested because you want to see them moving. You want to see the bows, the violins moving. You want to see the director and so on. And so the visibility, when we can achieve it, and we cannot always achieve it, but when we can, we should do it, I think. And this is the evidence for that. Now, the verbal communication with the audience, this organist was very good at this. He did not talk long. It was one, two, or three sentences between most of the pieces, giving interesting information. And still, if you look at the numbers here, it is not quite as good as the others. What I have thought is if you have written program notes, that this may be almost as good as the verbal communication. So, but you need to communicate something to the audience that will help them to connect with the music. That's what all of these six lines here are. Help to the, org the audience to connect with the music. This Fantastic, Carl. Let me jump in a little bit and ask uh, um, and say something. Comment just on this on verbal communication, uh, because uh, probably what you are referring to, if you talk uh, during the program, right? If you communicate with people, probably people are uh, more inclined to focus more on the music when they're listening. Uh, basically, you are directing their attention with your words, right? That is right. You you are trying to say, listen to this, or if you play, uh, let's say, you're playing a very scholastic fugue, right? You can say things like, here is the subject, the theme, right? And you play just the theme uh, with simple principle stop. And then, hey guys, I give you an assignment. Let's count the number of themes in this in this uh, piece. And, and afterwards, we'll talk about how many of, of, of themes you, did you hear. You see, 10 or 20 or 8. And that's, that's like, uh, that's like uh, giving an elephant a stick. Do you know the story of an elephant with, who goes uh, to the village in India? 
uh, and uh, eats bananas from villagers, you know. And uh, in order for <laughs> for this elephant to be quiet, villagers and and farmers uh, f- uh, thought, oh, maybe let's give a stick to hold uh, to that uh, uh, elephant. And he was busy, right? Being busy is good. His mind is occupied uh, with this stick. So maybe that's the case with with organ enthusiasts and organ music lovers who come to you to recitals we give some information to think about the music while listening but that's that's verbal communication is very important right well yes it can be helpful i think now the last two numbers here however as you can see are the greatest and uh this uh, organist as he was playing he was moving around on the bench uh, uh, to the music uh, and he was, you could say, easily having fun. He was enjoying what he was doing. It was obvious. He was adding additional notes and so on, things that you and I would never do when we play Bach. He was not doing that at all. Instead, he was adding on things and his creativity and so on rated very, very high. Of interest at the bottom of the screen is the fact that the musical backgrounds were not related to these scores. The, the few people that we had that were classically trained, they still liked it. At the same time, from the general population, 30% of the people said they would like to have heard more classical music from this man. That's interesting. It is. In it fact, is. We, we are inviting him back in October this year, and I sp- am specifically asking him, please, play more classical music, because, see, it is this balance that people are searching out here. Nevertheless, at the very bottom, you can see that these people rated this concert very high, 9.66 on a 1 to 10 point scale, and 95% of them gave ratings of 9 or 10, which is very, very high. Fantastic, fantastic uh, research, Carl. I think it makes sense to to make these questionnaires and surveys. Uh, I remember a few years ago in in our university church here in in Vilnius, Saint John's Church. I also wanted to find out uh, what uh, people think uh, during concerts and recitals, and before the concerts, with their tickets and programs, they get they get you know uh, a little. A sheet of paper with questions from me, right? Similar yes. kind of question, but not as detailed as you were thinking about. Um, and also, you, they could rate uh, from 1 to 10 and comment and uh, maybe even uh, put some ideas on paper what they would like to hear next uh, for the next recital, you know. And yes. that makes sense. Uh, they feel very valued. Uh, but you know what I did also in addition to that? Uh, uh, at the very bottom of this of this uh, sheet of questionnaire, I asked this one question: If you would like to know more about this particular organist and or our music program, please uh, write your email address here, and uh, yes. we, we will we will then uh, put your uh, your name on the list, and we can communicate with you, you know, like a newsletter or a blog, something to keep in touch, not as in a spammy way, but uh, to to keep relationships going and uh, uh, up, uh, to 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 make this more personal, you know. And a lot of people liked that idea and uh, put that in pen- in pencil email. So that's that's Wonderful. how you can gr- grow your your database basically also. I like exactly what you've done there. I think that's very consistent with this. I'm glad you've done it. Okay, so those are the three studies that we have done. And in view of the time, do you want me to go ahead and and finish this? There's one more slide that has to do with additional possible tools to increase the appeal of organ music. And then I have a number of pictures, eight or ten pictures. Do you want me to go ahead and, and do that in view of our time, or do you want to stop here? No, no, no. We we have plenty of time. Uh, as much as you want, please, Carl. Uh, okay. Give us some insight. All right. Thank you for this kind invitation you've given me. Okay. Now, what about additional? We have really discussed then and studied six different tools for the organist to increase the appeal of organ music. Here are four more that I have not studied 
that you may find of interest and other people can find of interest. First, the length of the pieces played. If you are appealing to a general audience, not all musicians, not all Bach lovers or whatever, shorter pieces are likely better. That's been my experience. I wish in these studies I had timed how long it took the organist to do each piece, but I did not do that. But that's my impression. Second, and you mentioned this earlier, Vitus, frequent changes in registration help to maintain interest. And we know that a number of our famous organists, you know, people like Bach, Buxtehude, and so on, played on organs that it was difficult to change registration, and they tend to have few changes in registration. But when you can introduce more changes, it seems to maintain in, in interest. A third point is that if you can add other instruments to the organ, that also seems to broaden appeal to people generally. I'll show you examples in a moment. And then finally is a radical point, and that is, how about if we focus more on bringing organ to the people instead of insisting that the people come to hear the organ? Very Now, radical. that's an interesting very question. Very innovative question. Very good. Right. And so now I turn to our Seattle chapter of the American Guild of Organists. In the last year, we are uh, uh, trying to follow this last point of bringing the organ to the people. So we have this organ. It's a nice, portative, three-rank instrument. It was made by Marceau and Associates in Seattle. You can take the top part off, lift it off, and put it on a cart and you can move it fairly easily. Okay, it has an eight-foot gedect on it, a four-foot spire flute, and a two-foot principal. And we have undertaken the idea of taken, taking this organ to the shopping mall and playing music on organ there for the general public. So last Christmas time, we went to two different shopping malls in the Seattle area We played nine and a half hours. We had 11 organists who played in the shopping mall, and they played holiday music. Okay, this is for Christmas time, and it's not general classical music or general popular music. It has to be holiday music. So here's our dean, our current dean, Norma Amont Nelson, and as you can see, she's having a great time playing the organ. Then we, here is another one of our organists, and this is in the other shopping mall, and he has a children's choir at his church. And as you can see, they're all dressed up, and they came, and they sang holiday music to a substantial crowd. And if you look, you can see the people who are in the lower right-hand corner who are shooting pictures of this. Seeing children sing like that is very attractive, and shoppers will stop They're, they're shopping and come and listen to the organ and listen to the children. We, we enjoy children a great deal. And so this is an example. On the left is one of our organists, uh, Nick Strathy. And that happens to be his son there who has had piano music. He's about 10 years of age. And uh, we let him play the organ for the crowd. And they loved it. And we love, of course, getting children starting off early and learning the organ and having a positive impression. So we took the organ to them. And this is Wyatt Smith, and he's a very competent organist in the Pacific Northwest. And as you can see, he's having a lot of fun coming to the mall and playing the organ there. It's not a terrible thing to have people go to the mall and play. We get a number of them who are very happy to do it. And then you can see another one of our organists here, Rita Stoas, and you can see people who are all around who are listening to what she's playing. And in the middle of the background over there, you can't see, but that's Santa Claus over there because you're going by Santa Claus and people come and they hear the organ as it's being played. And so this was a wonderful time at the holidays, but we went further than this. 
We were invited to play as part of the Bach in the Subways program with his uh, birthday, his 331st birthday, which was last month. And so we went back to one of the malls and we played Bach music for four hours. Now this is how it went and it's of interest because some people in the audience sat there all four hours and listened to four hours of Bach, if you can imagine that. You don't think of that from people from the general population, but it does occur. This is Jiang Li, and she's a highly skilled uh, organist, and you can see some of her music there, and she's trying to play the most complicated of Bach pieces on a single manual organ, and that's very difficult. But anyway, there she is. But here we have David Lepsey, who is our director of communications, and he has a violinist he's brought in because, as you may know, Bach was a fabulous violinist, not just an organist, but a violinist. And he, of course, wrote violin music. And here's one of the people who's playing it. And then how about doing the flute along with the organ as played? And this is David Nichols and his wife, Sharon. And they always attract a crowd as they play because it's very intriguing music. Here's Susan Bloomfield in the green, is an organist here on Mercer Island and her Northwest Chamber Ensemble. And this also is one way of attracting people because as they go by, they can't help but pause and hear that cello. It sounds so good and they're playing Bach. And as you can see, we have our sign back there, music provided by the American Guild of Organists, the Seattle chapter, because this is the effort of our chapter. And I think, too, as you look at this picture of the overall uh, situation with the crowd there at the, the shopping mall, and you see this is Will Simpson, and this is a choir from his church. They are, You can't see them, but there's also a cellist there and a flautist there mm -hmm. who's playing. And wow, did they attract interest and attention. So these are some of the things I think that all of us can do in terms of bringing organ to the public and getting the public more interested in organ. And sometimes you may not have a portable organ like this, but maybe you have something else that would do it. Perhaps even an electronic organ. Obviously, we prefer a pipe, but nevertheless, maybe you have that that can be moved. And maybe in some places, maybe even a harmonium mm -hmm. or reed organ might, in fact, in a quiet place, be very much appreciated in a public situation. So the, these are ideas that in the, uh, up here in Seattle that we've come up with to bring the organ to p the public, and we hope that everybody will make every effort, just like you are doing with your secrets of organ, organ playing, uh, to bring the organ to people in general and get people appreciating the pipe organ. Fantastic, Carl. Uh, fantastic research. Fantastic results. Very inspiring, actually. I hope that people around the world from 89 countries will get so much out of this conversation and will try to do some of those ideas in practice, right? In, in, in some of those, uh, try to think uh, more creatively about the program. Try to do, try to do more, more variety. Try to do more familiarity with the uh, repertoire, right? Try to be more visible with the audience, maybe uh, to talk about the pieces here and there between the performance, maybe maybe more uh, enthusiastically and energetically, right? And um, yes. that's very, very good impact uh, for the people in general, right? Because it up uplifts, uplifts the spirit organ music, and you want as much as possible for that to happen. Yes. So, right. uh, so uh, can I jump in, Carl, and uh, offer three of uh, of my ideas? What I am doing uh, to expand uh, the reach uh, and love for the pipe organ here in Lithuania, and maybe that would be of interest uh, to to um, people around the world also. Uh, just very briefly, not not very scientifically or uh, generally. Uh, first of all, how about uh, how about uh, going to schools? and uh, getting in touch and getting to know school teachers, maybe music teachers, right? And offering them to, to give an organ demonstration. 
of your organ, oh. maybe in a church, right? And bring an entire class of students, uh, teenagers, whatever level, right? And uh, let me say this, Wayne Leopold has published uh, uh, more than 40 uh, different organ demonstrator uh, editions. You can choose from many different uh, ideas and stories around the world, um, biblical and uh, not only. You can improvise, yes. yes. It's a very, very flexible approach, basically. But it's very interesting to take these kids into the church and uh, to to show how the organ works, what is a little bit of a history, what was hydraulis, right? What it looked. Maybe you could tell some stories about that. You know, young people are very curious, and teenagers especially. So yes. we can fuel their curiosity and uh, empower them to learn more about the organ. So that's number one. And number two, how about uh, Im improvise, improvisation based on storytelling? Storytelling, uh, for example, could be um, biblical stories, right? Could be legends, myths from around the world, could be poetry. Um, and yes. you can print the words or the story storyline in the program notes right you can uh, add a right. synops synopsis of the action and you can uh, and an organist could really improvise so i've been doing this for a while for a few years and people starting to respond and uh, it's it's kind of uh, kind of uh, very very uh, impressive impressive thing, thing to watch uh, how people react to to improvisation and actually it's very classical music very uh, uh, modern music right otherwise people won't really want to go to academic organ recital actually with, without any talking but if you present yes. it with a story they could relate yes. to that story <laughs> and can focus their mind maybe even close their eyes and meditate on the text that they were uh, reading just a while ago and connect the music that they are hearing so that's number two and how about number three how about people around the world could think more creatively about their the sharing of their work to the people around them in social networks maybe uh, writing a blog or sharing a videos on youtube of their work maybe they they will maybe expand their reach also this way so that's what I've been yes. doing a little bit. Maybe that will be helpful to others as well. Yes, I think you, your, your ideas are very good. I had not thought of the storytelling at all. We have taken this work into schools. We have appealed to children. I love that idea. I think your third idea is also very good. The, the second, though, with the stories, I, I'm intrigued by that. That's the, really a wonderful idea, I think. I'm glad you're doing it. What, well, just last Saturday, just last Saturday, April, April, April 16, I played the uh, uh, improvisation recital at that church uh, on the largest pipe organ in Lithuania, uh, based on the uh, uh, excerpt from the book of Revelation, cha seventh chapter. It's called uh, the the triumph of the elect. You re remember the story about the innumerable innumerable number of people uh, all clad in white robes holding uh, branches of palms in their hands and praising God and uh, the Lamb. It's very religious, you know, and very uh, sure. colorful and uh, visionary. And it fits this occasion uh, when we have after Easter, right? And uh, I printed out the text, the entire text, uh, maybe maybe uh, one page, and people really could, could hear and uh, connect with the music much better this way. And I do not only religious music, also stories, legends. Uh, this this year I will be playing uh, the famous myth uh, called the Beowulf. Also, do you know this uh, this legend, uh, 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 Anglo-Saxon legend from the med me medieval times? So we'll see how people will respond to, for example, Beowulf Good. or nor other Nordic uh, stories. That, but that's that's something to think about, and. Um, and maybe that could be also applied in practice. Very good. Yes. Good, good. I'd say go for it. Give it a try. See if it works. Great. So, fantastic research. One more time. You've been so generous, Carl, with your time and ideas. 
um, please continue to do this uh, also uh, um, you presented some closing ideas uh, uh, for the further research right maybe maybe you yes. can also uh, deliver on that in the future that would be great to see um, and uh, and maybe pipe organ art will survive this century who knows we hope we hope it will happen right i believe it will mm -hmm. it it all depends on our joint efforts of course not only on organi organizational level like ago which does a tremendous important job uh, in keeping organ art alive but but on yeah. a personal level what can one organist do right a simp simple, yeah. very, very average skill organists do. These ideas that you talked about are very practical, actually, and can be applied to, to majority of organists probably in the world who are playing in public at, at, at all. So, so thank you so much, Carl. You, you are a tremendous gift to to organ world and uh, keep w doing the work that matters. Well, thank you very kindly, and thank you for doing the important work that you're doing on the secrets of organ playing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's keep in touch. If you find the topic of increasing attendance in organ recitals relevant to your work, make sure you visit Pipe Organ Foundation's website at www.pipeorganfoundation.org and click on the section called News. There you will find Dr. Carl Dodrill's three articles on the topic of increasing attendance of organ recitals. And don't forget to explore further the website of Pipe Organ Foundation. The mission of this organization is to charitably promote the preservation, placement and playing of pipe organs. I hope this will be valuable to you. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online really soon.